including conference winners, odds to win their individual conference. We want to begin with the Atlantic 10, uh, the A-10, which is another one of these conferences that thoroughly confuses you because they got more than 10 teams, just like the Big Ten's got like 20 teams or 37 teams now, uh, and the Big 12 doesn't have 12 teams anymore. Nonetheless, I digress. Uh, Atlantic 10 conference odds. And uh, big man, I want to start with you and what stands out to you out of that board where clearly Dayton and Virginia Commonwealth are favorite uh, favorites. Uh, look down at the bottom at, at Davidson, usually a traditional team is, is, is plus 1600 to win the conference. What stands out off the A-10 futures board to you, Jeff Nadu? Well, I think as a lot of the time bookmakers do, they're looking at what previously happened. And I feel like in this case, to me, it doesn't mean that much. I mean, for me, the play that I made is really more about not only the team I'm betting, but about the other teams in this conference. When we look at VCU, they're going to deal with a new head coach. Ace Baldwin's long gone. That Mike Rhodes regime is out. So I kind of figured they're not going to be as potent to me. I kind of feel like where I have my power rankings, to me, I would put St. Bonaventure above uh, pretty much really every team other than Dayton. And I look at Dayton and I say to myself, well, you know, obviously they're always good defensively, but when you look at like Ken Pomeroy, Dayton is 69th in the country, St. Bonaventure 70th. While Dayton's better defensively, I actually have St. Bonaventure significantly higher than them on offense. When you look at what um, Schmidt has done up at St. Bonaventure, and I kind of want to focus solely on them. The last two seasons with this team, one of the things that really jumped out to me um, was the fact that they had some good basketball teams, particularly in 2022 with like a Kyle Lofton, Oshun Ashuni, but they had no bench. 358 in bench minutes in 2021. You look at last year, another very uh, sparse group, 343rd in bench minutes. They also were a group last year that really had struggles with continuity, a lot of new names, a lot of new faces. There are some new faces this year, but one thing I love about this roster on paper is, first of all, they're very deep. They have seven, eight, nine kids that can play and add to this roster. You look at a lot of the names they had last year, they're all back. Kyrell Luke, Daryl Banks, Chad Venning, all these top kids. But you look at what they bring in. They bring in a very quality player, Mike Adams Woods from Cincinnati, a kid that can play guard for them, can give you a little bit of a spurt. But the big add to me, Charles Pride. Uh, Charles Pride is a high-level scorer you probably never heard of, but we've all heard the name Bryant. That's been a trendy team over the last right. couple of years. Daryl or um, Charles Pride is one of the top scorers coming over from them. He's one of their leading scorers in the history of that program. This group all of a sudden has instant offense. They're more cohesive. They're a lot deeper. And in an A-10 that to me just isn't very good this year, I I'm looking at Bonnie's at, at, at nearly 7-1, to and I'm thinking – this is kind of an open group. I like them a lot. Corby, I know you don't have an official take here on this conference. Give me a 30-second take on the A-10 and anything stand out on that board right there. Yeah, the first thing I saw when I circled this this game that uh, Nadu talked about was the Charles Pride is on that team, and that is uh, always fun to watch. The, the guy has has some Kobe soul in him. Like you, you saw him trash talk every player that he played against in Bryant last year. So definitely an instant game changer. I think that it, he's getting slept on. Like if you look at Bart Torvik, they have him as the fifth most uh, important player on their team. And I would argue that he's probably second or third. So being underrated there. Um, I do worry about Dayton. Dayton, obviously a really good team, but I, I completely agree with the same bottom should be second in this class. So getting uh, basically 650, which should probably be 380 if they're in second place. So I think you're getting a really good price. Dayton, a really tall team, which we'll come back to what I'm about to talk about with my teams. Uh, I, I love me some height. So Dayton worries me with height, uh, but that's basically it. I think the yeah. problem is, r real quick with Dayton, uh, look, they lost so much. I mean, you lose Kamar, you lose Amsil. You, they lost a lot of talent this year. Is Deron Holmes, look, we know he's a good player, but does he have the capabilities to handle um, being kind of that top guy? Because when you had the other kids there, you can kind of key in on them, and he's a little bit more of, a, of an option. But – you know, again, Dayton's good. I just, to me, it was too big of a golf between the odds. I have them kind of neck and neck as, as one, too. Let's lock him in. Let the record reflect at the beginning of all of this leading to the final four. The first play on the show is Jeff Nadu with St. Bonaventure to win the Atlantic 10 on a future play of plus 650. Again, thank you for finding us. A lot of you are joining us here on the program. Hit that like button if you're in the live chat. Live Q&A coming up. We're going over some conference winners first, as you see on our slate, on our, our preview show here. We'll get to some final four odds, some national title odds. Up next, 
the Big West. Interesting here in this conference. Uh, seems to be wide open from year to year. Corby Craig, you're going to take this with a play that stands out to you out of a league that is all of the California schools plus Hawaii in the mix in the smaller, uh, smaller major basketball conference. Uh, Corby, thoughts here on a Big West futures play to win a conference? Yeah, I took UC Irvine to win the Big West at three to one. Uh, Nadu brings up a really good point. Like it, usually, when you're betting futures, you look for these middle of the pack, maybe a little higher echelon uh, in conference tournament in these really small conferences. Also, I think it's hilarious that uh, our first our first two bets of the college basketball season are St. Bonaventure and UC Irvine. Uh, but <laughs> but from a, from a standpoint of like talent in, in these Big West, Big South, which we're going to talk about in a minute, I, I think that. The upper echelon is kind of significantly better than the lower side. Like you'll see UC San Diego, Irvine probably is a 10 point spread uh, in season. But the, the thing that just completely differentiates these teams is size. And it's, it's a recurring theme that you'll see in my next two bets is, is I do think there are elite players in these, in these talent pools, but I think that more important than not, there are schemes and, and sizes that just like uh, a Santa Barbara cannot compete with a UC Irvine who has a seven foot center, a six eleven power forward, a six nine stretch forward. Like they're going to have so much size that, like, if you say that, if you say that all talent is equal, Irvine has the edge in basically every single game this season. The only team that, if you go look through the Big West, can really match up in a just player versus player matchup is Long Beach State. They they have some size. But other than that, like this Hawaii team, I'm, I'm pretty low on Hawaii. I think that uh, they shouldn't be they shouldn't be second in this in this field anyways. UC Davis not bad, but at the end of the day, Irvine has the best talent, uh, and it's not a, it's not a massive edge there. But I think that the size and coaching ability, like uh, you're talking three four inches basically in every position, uh, and so three to one, uh, I'll take an Irvine team that's basically proven themselves year over year for quite some time at this point. And Jeff, this is kind of an obscure late night conference that we'll see all the time midweek during the season. Any thoughts on the big West here real quick, even if not an official uh, play in the futures market? I mean, I hate to come in here and school uh, Corby right away, but I'm going to. Um, he, he forgets that Irvine didn't even win the conference last year. Guess who won? The Gauchos, Santa Barbara. And Corby, right. the thing that matters most in March when this truly matters is guard play. And when you look at Pierre Louis, when you look at who they have there, AJ Mitchell, um, you know, it's just too good a group. And I'll combat what you said about size. Look, the best big in this conference coming into the conference is Johan Traore, Auburn transfer on Santa Barbara, 6'11, 235. He was a top 10 player uh in the overall class in 2022. I know he didn't see a ton of court time at Auburn, but it's Auburn. It's the SEC, it's top level right. basketball. In America, you put him into a conference like this, I think all of a sudden he becomes one of the top players. Look, is he as good as what Russell Turner's group has kind of from two or three kids? Maybe not, but um, he's going to give you a lot of options. Throw in the fact that they have a couple different players that I think come in. Look, are they going to be, again, as good as Turner's group up front? Maybe not, but the guard play is significantly better. I think you could talk nationally about how good Pierre Louis and, and AJ Mitchell are. They're that good, I think, as a duo. Um, I saw Pierre Louis when he was at Temple. Really enjoyed him as a player. So her brother played uh, there as well. I like uh, I like Santa Barbara, but again, defensively, Russell Turner's groups are always very good. I mean, in those late night games, uh, that whole late night thing. The thing about these conferences, it's so um, you know, a lot of people don't as we know, focus on these groups because A, they're smaller, and B, this is particularly tough because they're so late at night and right. people aren't looking at them. But I do find it funny that these are the two conferences, necessarily this one is, is the first one we're talking about. But yeah, I'll go the other way. I'll go with the Gauchos who uh, won this conference last year. Interesting you're playing devil's advocate, but you're not making an official play. Let's come back on camera. The official play here is Corby Craig's, and he says – Ant eaters of UC Irvine officially looking to cash a three to one ticket. Uh, I'm always partial to Hawaii and those late night, like 1 a.m. starts Eastern time that they have that are that are 7 a.m. local. That's because you're a degenerate. Uh, well, I mean, uh, it's always good on the uh, on the DVR, let's say, too, uh, to to record a game, and then you get up uh, Eastern time, seven or eight a.m., and you can watch a game that just got over with a couple of hours ago, uh, and see what the Hawaii uh, Rainbows are up to as well. But uh, Corby says for that conference, he likes in the Big West, Irvine. Let's move on in our conference winners. 
uh, for this future show and make a play on the American Athletic Conference. So this conference has undergone some change, obviously, with the likes of UCF, Houston, Cincinnati, leaving it, moving to the Big 12, adding new teams like UAB, like Liberty, like New Mexico State, um, uh, et cetera, or uh, uh, even some other ones, UAB being added to the conference. And I'm trying to see uh, who else that got added in there for basketball purposes as well. North Texas, North Texas. got Charlotte. added in there as well, as, long, as well as Charlotte. Uh, all right, so big man, back to you. Florida Atlantic was the darling of Conference USA. We should mention that they won Conference USA. They've now promoted into the American Athletic Conference. You still love this Final Four team, and you've already alluded to it because a lot of it is back, including the guard play. Correct. I mean, essentially, this entire team is back. They did lose one player. Um, that said, I mean, I do think they have the capabilities to replace him quite quick. Listen, I want to make this clear, and you did a good job of doing that. I just want to further say this is not to win the national title. This is just That's to right. win their conference, though I will admit uh, a day or two after the tournament ended, I did play them to win the national title. I just feel like, again, culture to me is so important, and that will become evident in – two of the games that I bet, or two of the teams that I bet to win the national title. Culture is very important. Dusty May, it's clear that he has built a culture quite quickly in Boca Raton. Um, they've got a ton of money to kind of upgrade their athletic facilities. You notice not one of these kids left. Um, that's a testament to what the culture is there. And to me, when you have cohesion, you have continuity, it's no secret that every year those are generally the teams that go far in college basketball. And you'll hear those C words all the time when it comes to me. Um, I don't need to talk much on the court, but when I look at this conference, this is another conference to me that's not particularly strong this year. UAB loses Jelly Walker. I know Corby knows all about that. That's a huge loss. Um, throw in the fact Wichita, they have a new coaching regime. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of the groups that we've kind of noticed, SMU, they lost a, a bunch of talent last year. Uh, Temple University lose Damian Dunn and, and Battle. That's a big loss. And I know, you know, for you, TJ, the, the big, I think, question is who competes with FAU in this conference? I, I guess it's Memphis, and, and I'll say it's Memphis. Right. Look, they have plenty of talent, but you, you look at kind of off the court, I mean, it, it just seems like they never seem to get uh, what they totally want. Throw in the fact that I've said before, I, th I think Penny Hardaway is one of the worst X and O coaches in America. I just don't think he's very good. Um, the Mikey Williams stuff sucks. He could have been really good there, and I think he could have worked at a really high level. It's a shame what's happened there. Um, but, um, but yeah, FAU to me is, is, I mean, I would probably lay a price if I had to here. I think this is a, I think it's a pretty easy bet, quite frankly. I love UA or I love the FAU on the court and off the yeah, court. Yeah. Florida and Florida Atlantic and Memphis are linked from last year because FAU, oh boy, beat my Memphis Tigers in the opening round, uh, in comeback fashion or Buzzard. else that run, that run never happens to the final four. Obviously it's over with on the opening night. Uh, Corby, a quick thought here. North Texas obviously has a new coaching staff, uh, with Grant McCaslin moving on to Texas tech. Uh, USF, South Florida in Tampa, where I'm based, new coaching staff with Amir uh, Abdur uh, Rahim, uh, who had been at Kennesaw State. So you, you have some new blood in this league, some new coaching staffs. Uh, just a quick 30 second take here. I know you're not making an official play on this. Yeah, I think the only argument you can make it, or even try to make in conference tournaments is like, who competes and and you look at this conference and you're like really nobody like uh uab lost four or five starters eric gaines is now going to be their leader which if you've ever watched eric play he's not really a leader so like it, basically everyone's out of the picture except memphis and you're not getting a good enough price to back memphis though i will say they brought javon quinterly i really like quinterly i thought he wasn't used mm -hmm. to his fullest magnitude at alabama um that said uh, like Nadu brought up like hey one guy is cool uh, Florida Atlantic has five of them. And I, I don't think that even if they brought uh, Quinterly's prime for every single game, that they have the ability to have the cohesion. Like this is a, this more than any sport is such a team sport that like Quinterly can only do so much. And uh, I, I don't know if Memphis has, they have the talent. Do they have the coaching? Do they have the pieces at, at like maybe seven to one? I would say yes, but like lower than two to one. I am not buying Memphis by any means here. Florida Atlantic definitely would be the side for me uh, if anything. If you're not familiar, Jeff was bringing up the – he's a San Diego high school kid, right? He's a Southern California high school kid, uh, Mikey Williams. that has got gun charges that's going to prevent him from being able uh, to be anywhere, including Ma Memphis. Mikey Williams, 
Mikey Williams needs to worry about uh, football numbers that he's going to get uh, in prison. Uh, this is <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just serious. This is not it's like it's not like he had a gun in his possession. He shot at a moving vehicle uh, with people inside. It's uh, he, it ain't good. He it what a yeah. very sad story. If we're being honest, he was a top level player in America. Uh, a real shame. Yep, not going to be part of college basketball, but in this conference, Florida Atlantic, FAU, seems to be the darling. Jeff Nadeau says, I'll grab that plus 100 on a futures play uh, in that conference. Again, thank you for joining us. If you're doing so live, we're going to be here Monday through Friday, starting this Monday as the college basketball season gets underway. Uh, right here on BetUS TV. This is the future show. We're handicapping some things in advance. Let's move different conferences. We've got one more to make, and this one is the Big South. I will say up front, I got the privilege of working on national radio on TuneIn, the Big South Tournament Championship that UNC Asheville did win. They struggled in both the semifinal game and the championship game, almost lost to a Campbell school with a losing record uh, in the Big South title game, but did find a way to get it done, then they got wiped out of the NCAA tournament. But Asheville is an interesting play to repeat in the Big South. Uh, Corby Craig, I'll let you begin things here. What do you like? Why did the Big South stand out to you for a conference play? Yeah, a few reasons. First off, this is the spinning champ. And um, I, uh, if you bring back, so first off, I, I, I really like size. We've talked about this. Uh, and more important than size, this team brings back arguably the best player in the league, who I would argue is the best player, Drew Pember. Uh, you're talking about a big man, 6'10", I don't think can really be guarded in this league. I mean, we saw, uh, what, 20 and a half points a game, nine rebounds, like three assists. Like, uh, even when they were doubling through, I think that he's a smart enough basketball player to make the right decisions. Uh, they keep a team. Uh, they will start five seniors this year. So they keep a team that obviously knows how to run the scheme, knows – what they want to do, and, and again, this is a, a really big fade on, not really big, but like when betting conference futures, you have to look at, at other teams and say like, who who could beat Asheville? Like for the price, who wins this? And, and though I do think that there's obviously teams in conference, they can beat this Asheville team. I just, for the price you're getting, I don't I don't believe. So like Longwood, uh, a decent basketball team who likes to run their scheme, uh, but when down in the dumps, is, is Longwood going to be able to run uh, a, a slower tempo, or are they going to be able to do anything that they want to do, or are they going to have to play towards Asheville's pace? I, I don't think so. Winthrop, the team that we've seen year over year, been pretty decent. Uh, and then if you go look at projected numbers, you have Winthrop as an eight-point dog on a neutral site versus Asheville in the regular season. So it, the market kind of agrees that Asheville is, it has really high upside, and uh, with the best player and the most size I, to, at 2.5 to 1, I, uh, I hopped on Asheville here. And again, Drew Pember is that player at Tennessee transfer, a seven-footer, plays on the perimeter some. So, Jeff, any quick thoughts here on an Asheville repeat like Corby is high on? You know, I actually really like this team, not only from winning this conference, but I think if they make it at the NCAA tournament, I'd be interested to see what they do in another year against, um, you know, a top-level team. I, I think on paper, look, he mentioned Pember, who was at Tennessee He's one of the best mid-major players in America. You also look at the fact, like, they have their top point guard back, uh, Caleb Burgess, who was at Hofstra. He was the top assist guy in the Big South last year. Also bring in Greg Gant, who, look, I thought was a decent player at NC State. Also, I don't know why I know this, but when he came out of high school, he was actually valedictorian of his high school uh, uh, cl senior class. So he's a smart kid. He's a good basketball player, good basketball. Something IQ, that sure. Nadu never had to worry about being the valedictorian. That's okay. But go <laughs> no, ahead. Yes. No, I, I did not. Uh, but I, then again, I had like a high school class, like 600. So it wasn't okay. easy. Um, that said, I really like this team. I, they, Fletcher Aby's back, top sh uh, three-point shooter. I really like this group. I, I think, you know, he also mentioned the rest of this conference. You know, Pat Kelsey and Winthrop, that regime is long gone. I think Radford's interesting. Brian Antoine's a good player. I mean, I know coming out of New Jersey, top prospect going to Villanova. It didn't actually work out there. He was pretty good last year for Radford. But, you know, as we've talked about, does one player equate to beating a, a group that, from a starting five standpoint, is quite good? I, I think this is a bargain on, on Asheville. They're surely the best team. And I think a, quite an interesting team in the kind of the, you know, maybe make a run, maybe get to the Sweet 16 and, and win a game or two. And their matchup last year, as I recall, was UCLA. They had to go all the way out west. I want to say that the it was like San Jose or wherever they went, and they were a no-show in an early game, got wiped out in the first half of that game. You never know in those matchups, to Jeff's point on that for Asheville. But Corby Craig, we lock him in on a Big South Futures ticket on UNC Asheville. 
out of the Big South. 